again. Um, I was asked to, to give a presentation on um, assessing and modeling impacts. And I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about that, not only the talk, but, but the topic over the last 10 to 15 years. And um, what I want to do today is to provide more of a conceptual framework um, and share with you how I think about assessing impacts of invasions in marine environments. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will essentially generate discussion as we go forward. Um, I think I'll pose more questions and, and problems than I'll answer, unfortunately, but my intention is to um, stimulate discussion about how we think about impacts. Um, and, and this is a, a, an issue that comes up frequently in, in invasions, but probably other environmental issues as well. So you study invasions, what's the problem? Is it a problem? How big is the problem? And so I, I'm often asked that question, not, not only from scientists, but also from, from public and friends and in a variety of different venues. And, and I, I've thought of a lot about how, how can we characterize the impacts associated with invasions. And I, I think we can say that invasions are, are very widespread. Um, we, we've talked about sort of uh, different, different windows into invasions from a, a continental scale to a regional scale, and, and, and now we just heard a very nice talk about the Azores. Um, we, we know that some of them are exerting very strong effects. Calerpa is a good example of that. We heard about that this morning. Um, so, so there are examples of, of species that are of great concern that we, we know are having strong effects, strong interactions in the community and altering um, not only biodiversity but also critical resources, in some cases human health. Um, so there, there are some model systems that we look, look to. And, and we see that they're increasing in number. That is the problem. Th those two issues are becoming bigger over time. That, that there, there are more species in play and their geographic range is expanding. So, so those are, are things that I'm, I'm comfortable saying and that I think there, there's very good support for. They're, they're very general statements. They're not very specific. And so, and so the challenge for us, I think, is how, how do we come, become more quantitative and, and actually identify what the consequences of invasions are for a particular species, for a particular region, or, f or for a very broad scale? And it's that type of, of, of comparison and, and information that's really of interest to, to managers who are looking at how to, how to um, decide what amount of money they should spend and what the priorities are. And, and also for policy. Um, you know, if something is having an impact, it, it's a motivator for, for policy makers to, to make a change. If we're uncertain or the levels of uncertainty as we go from certain to, to less certain to very uncertain, it, it becomes much more difficult to um, justify funding as well as, as policy. Um, and I, I think that the, the tendency often is in, in thinking about non-native species invasions in general, there's a, there's a very wide range of, of terms as, it, as in any field. And we, we tend to use descriptors of, of impact and, and these are just a few. But, but we're often very challenged to define what we mean by that. So we, we, we know what we mean. It, it's having a significant effect on some level. Um, and, and these are the sorts of terms that, that um, we use to convey that. Um, above some, some level, something becomes noxious. It becomes a pest. Um, it becomes invasive. But, but where is that boundary? At, at what point do we decide it's crossed that, that threshold and become a pest? an invasive species. And, and we've not done a very good job, at least um, in, in North America, we've not done a very good job of defining what those thresholds are in, in a very uh, quantitative and rigorous way. It causes some level of impact somewhere above some threshold, and, and <laughs> society cares about it. But, but what, what do we mean by that? I mean, there, there, there are terms that we use. These are just terms for pest in the dictionary. Some of them apply and some of them don't. But, but they're, they're very, many of them are, are very vague. 
in, in terms of what those thresholds are. Um, and I, I think that often there's a tendency for people to consider all non-native species, all invasions to be um, negative. In, in, in invasion, I think, has a negative connotation generally, as does invasive. But, but in reality, I think that, that as, as we all recognize, um, you know, we have a, a very broad pool of species that are being transferred and a subset of those become in, are actually released and introduced into the environment. You know, subsets still that are established and then as, as we um, move to different levels of impact, it, the, the um, pyramid becomes smaller and smaller. So only a subset of species actually cross some threshold and become a pest and, and actually have significant impacts. But, but still, how do we define what those are? Um, and I think we can, as I said earlier, I think we can, we can all think of examples of species, non-native species invasions that, that have had significant effects, and these are just some of them in, in marine and terrestrial and freshwater systems. So they're, they're good model systems to look, look to to indicate that, that invasions are, are significantly changing the world. And, and, and not only the structure of, of communities, marine communities, but also the function and the services, fisheries and, and other services that we, we enjoy for, as a society. Um, so I don't mean to say that invasions aren't, aren't having an impact, they are, but, but how do we actually characterize and quantify that? And you know, we, we can point to examples this is, of course, a European crab, but it's, it's globally distributed and achieves very high abundance. This is a trap that I set in Australia and Tasmania, fished for 24 hours. We, we know that it's affecting native biota. There's a green crab, a European crab, preying on a, a native grapsid crab in California. It's caused significant declines of that grapsid crab. It's caused significant declines of, of a number of bivalve species. So, so there are examples like this that, that we can point to. Um, we, we see, you know, the, in the case of Nemeopsis, that's colonized the, the Black Sea. Um, coincident with that, we see a significant sh shift in the community structure in terms of productivity and, um, you know, no, a number of different measurements that ha has tended to be not only associated but, but um, the, the cause of those changes are, are attributed to Nemeopsis, partly because the mechanism of, of interaction is, is known and it's consistent, but I think it's still challenging, even in a case like this, to say that Nemeopsis caused those changes. It's, it's a correlative shift, and certainly Nemeopsis is not the only thing that's changed that interacts with those different parameters. There, there's disturbance, there's pollution, there, there are fishing pressure, there's a vi wide range of things. So while we can point to examples in a correlative way at, at shifts that have occurred coincident with the arrival of a species, what's the cause and effect relationship? And we, we know as ecologists that the world isn't simple. There are complex interactions. There are direct effects, there are indirect effects. So how do we tease those apart with, with some degree of confidence? I think that's the challenge that we, we all face. Um, I, I've been thinking about this for, for quite some time and um, I've taken a, a couple of attempts to really characterize what we, what we, what I know about impacts in, in, in a North American context. This is a, a figure from a paper that we published looking at impacts of non-native species in Chesapeake Bay. We know of about 200 non-native species that have established populations in Chesapeake Bay. Um, and if you look at the literature to, to understand what people have, have suggested have impacts and their abundance, this is a pattern that, that you see. So about 40 species, about 20% are thought to have significant impacts. Somewhere, someone said, this species is of concern, it's having a significant impact. 57, maybe, are having an impact. Someone thinks, has reported in the literature in an analysis and an assessment. About half of them have never been evaluated. There's no comment. So if you look at the 
distribution of those 40 species that have a probable impact, a little over 50% are thought to be, are, are actually abundant at some spatial scale, whether it's square meters, kilometers, you know, some measure of abundance. Uh, maybe a quarter common, and then rare and some unknown. And then you, you can look at the distribution for these others. So, so the tendency is that um, of those that are having a probable impact, it's more likely that, that they're abundant in the community. And, and that might be a, a signal that people have cued into, as well as perhaps the mode of action, what's known about a, a fish as a predator, a plant as a, a dominant, an aspect dominant in the community. But you know, this, this is the pattern that appears from the literature. And then if you look at the, the information, the, the data that underlies that, um, this, this is the analysis that we did. So for those 40 species, this is the type of impact that was reported. And this is what we characterize as an information type. So zero means there really were no data. Someone thought that the species had an impact. I, I don't mean to say they're wrong. They may well be correct. But how do we support that? Um, one means that there was some observational change. Could be quantitative. I'm sorry, it, it, it's categorical. Someone observed a change but did not measure it. Two is a, is a correlative change. And, and then as we come further on the axis, their, their laboratory sort of mechanistic understanding laboratory experiments, field experiments, and, and actually a, a Bakke design before, after, control impact design. So increasingly quantitative if you want to think about that. So the, the very depressing thing to me is that although the perception is that invasions are having a strong impact in Chesapeake Bay, or were at the time we did this analysis, we're hard pressed to really characterize and, and quantify what that impact is. And, and again, I don't mean to say that people are wrong. They may well be right. But, but how do we assess, how do we evaluate the, the, the quality of that? More recently, we did an analysis of, of crustacean invasions for all of North America. As I told you earlier today, about 100 species of crustaceans are introduced in marine waters of North America. For those, 28% are reported to have some impact, considered to have a significant impact, similar sort of analysis. 23%, about a quarter, have some sort of lab or field experiment. 50% of, of those 30 species are thought to have a major change, a, a, you know, a large, a, a large uh, magnitude impact, a mag large effect size. On a resident population, um, meaning causing decline, or on an economic scale, some measurable effect like a fishery or, or something like that. However, uh, only about a quarter of those, are, or put another way, 73%, there's a high level of uncertainty, meaning the quality of data is not really sufficient to evaluate how um, big the effect size is, how, how significant that species was in, in affecting the change. And again, I don't mean to say that, that you know, those species are not having impact, but how we evaluate that I think is very important, and especially um, being clear about what we know and what we don't know. And, and the, the unfortunate part of this is that there's an awful lot that we don't know. Maybe not surprising to anyone in the room, we have a few, again, a few good species that are models that help us understand that invasions are a significant impact. But for most species, we don't know what the impact is, the magnitude of the impact. And, and those are direct impacts, not the indirect impacts that we know to be important in, in community interactions. Um, from the crustaceans, these are the, number, the percent of species that are thought to have this type of impact. But the information quality is very uneven. So, so when something, um, we, we can talk clearly about what an impact is or isn't, what information we have or we don't have, but when, when does something become a, a pest or invasive? I, I don't know the answer to that. It's very subjective at this point. 
in, in many cases, unfortunately. And, and I would expect that a, 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 an individual species will have a high degree of variation in what the impact is spatially. If you look at the same species in three different locations around the globe, maybe three different continents, would we expect it to have the same impact? I don't know. As an ecologist, I would say it's very context dependent. If you plop a species in the middle of a bay, it's going to depend on the environment there. It's going to depend on the, on the biota there. Why should we expect the same species, a species to have the same impact in a completely different context? Or do we expect that? But, but the literature is very confused about that, I think. You have the world's worst invaders. They, they probably are having very significant impacts in many, in, in particular locations. But that doesn't mean that species is going to have the same impact in each location. Conversely, we can say the same thing about time. So that's why the Chinese mitten crab is, is here. It goes through enormous eruptions like a, a periodical cicada, where it's, it's hugely abundant, crawls out of the water, um, has very big effects on, on water management, on, on a variety of things. But that's during an outbreak here. It goes through many years where we essentially can't find them in the environment where they, they occur. So there, there's this tremendous spatial and temporal variation that we really haven't come to grips with in, in thinking about impacts, I would suggest. Um, and decisions are often made about whether a species is, is um, whitelisted or blacklisted based on what the history of that species has been, sometimes in one location. And, and I think there's a challenge there that we really haven't come to grips with. Um, so in, in looking at how other people have approached this, I'm, I'm sure some of you know of the paper that Ingrid Parker and, and her colleagues published in 1999 that is attempting to assess or, or evaluate, um, provide a framework for thinking about how to evaluate impacts in a standardized way. And their suggestion was that we should think about impacts, I, as, as some sort of a, a integration or summation, um, a function of R, A, and E, R being the, the area occupied, A being some measure of abundance. They suggested average abundance, but we, we could relax that and say some measure of abundance, and then the per capita effect of that abundance. So that makes intuitive sense if you have a fixed area occupied, you can measure that. You can measure abundance within that area. And, and if you know what a per capita impact is, a, a change of effect, whatever the effect you're measuring is over that gradient, you can come up with some measure of impact. One of the, the challenges, of course, for us is that we, we can think about, excuse me, I go back. So, um, we, we can think about range size, and these are data for California that look at the number of, of estuaries occupied by non-native tunicates. And so this gives us some measure of geographic range. Um, we can do that as, as a step toward, toward looking at this integrative measure. Um, one of the problems for us, though, is that ranges are changing. And so if we think about, uh, about assessing an impact, it, it's, it's evolving over time as range, ranges expand. And, and I'm going to just flip through a number of, of species for which we, we see that the spread after introduction is, is happening. And these are just examples along the East Coast. Um, as with tunicates, we can look at whatever the geographic extent or the range is. Um, the last was a, a European crab. This is a periwinkle, also from Europe. An Asian crab, Hemigrapsus sanguineus. Um, this is a, a, a protistin parasite of oysters that causes the collapse of or, or high mortality in oysters on the east coast. Um, the, the tunicate, Stiella clava. And if, if we sort of sum across all of these species um, for either the Atlantic coast or the Pacific Coast, 
the, the, the overwhelming um, picture that emerges is that species spread. Most species spread after their initial point of introduction. And there, there's some indication that it, it's a function of time on the Atlantic coast or on the Pacific coast. These are invertebrates and algae. Um, what's plotted here are the degrees of latitude as a function of um, year of first record. So essentially, the longer something has been there, the longer, the, the more it's spread in terms of geographic range. Um, but most species spread. Only less than 20% of species on the Atlantic coast have not spread since introduction, and about 40% on the Pacific coast. So as we're thinking about impacts, it's a moving target if we just think about this range component. Um, com coming back to this, though, uh, I, I think good news is we can probably track the range if we're thinking about impact. The bad news is uh, I don't think we have very good abundance measurements for, for many species. And, and that abundance is fluctuating over time. So as we heard about Calerpa, this, this range has expanded, it's become very abundant, it's had significant impacts that, that are, have been measured very well. It's, it's one of these model species that we understand. But that abundance is fluctuating. Um, and un unlike Calerpa, I would say that most species, we, we, as I indicated earlier, we don't really have a per capita effect. We, we don't know what the effect of that, that species is on, on any real spatial scale. We have ideas if it's a filter feeder or if it's a space occupier or if it's a pathogen. But, but this relationship between how effect increases as population density increases and as area increases, I, I think we don't have a good perception on that. And it's not likely to be linear. It's likely to be nonlinear and, and have certain thresholds or bumps. But the shape function of that is, is um, not well defined for most species. Um, so I think the, the other thing that, that I, is really important to consider is going back to this issue of time. And we talked, I talked briefly about fluctuations through time. But the other thing that's likely to change is the per capita effect. And, and I think that's likely to be not only context specific for a particular geographic region, but, but also it's going to, to change as, as climate changes, as um, local conditions change from pollution or, or other, you know, other aspects of the community. And so the complexity is, is rather big. This, this is a diagram from a paper by Hellman. And this should be, I think this should read 2008 or 2009. Sorry about that. Um, but, but their paper, um, I think it was in conservation biology, is essentially a, a considering what the effect of climate change is generally on invasion dynamics, but one component is thinking about how it affects each of these components th that we believe is important for measuring impact. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's not clear what the directionality of that is, and it's likely to be idiosyncratic and, and different for different species. So I, I, I don't really have a good answer, which is probably disappointing. It's disappointing <laughs> for me. Um, but, but these are all sort of issues that I think we face when we consider what, what the impact is and modeling an impact. And I, and I think we're, we need to rise to the challenge to pick some model systems that really give us a better understanding about not only what is the impact, but, but how do we consider that on a, on a spatially and a tempor temporally relevant scale? And, and how do we use that information to um, make hard decisions about resource management and policy decisions. Um, and my goal with this was really to, to share some thoughts I've had about impacts and some of the challenges that I see that, that I myself have been facing over the last 10 to 15 years, and, and hopefully to stimulate some discussion. So thank you very much.